And the Lucerne Network Hardcore 2.0 episode 66 coming your way. Today we're doing the part two of how to hijack your testosterone levels by Europharma. And this one, you know, we had covered on the last episode, um, you know, different, different ideas of how to get your testosterone levels higher. We touched on some different topics. This one, we're going to get into more stuff. Um, we're going to talk about how anabolic steroids can affect your testosterone level. We're going to discuss some blood work scenarios that you're going to experience and what to look for. We're going to get into more and how to boost free testosterone using specific steroids. So this is going to be a really good one um, that you can really take advantage. Mobster has some good information as well that he has has uh, some new information um, on yep. these uh, these steroids that he's going to bring up later in the show as well. So it's going to be a really, really exciting show. And it's a very important show because we run steroids and we stack steroids. But here's the truth. Most people out there whether they're professional bodybuilders or whether they're amateurs, um, they're just gym rats who run these anabolic steroids, they don't understand how to stack them. And if they understand how to stack them, they'll be able to get more out of their cycle. So this is really going to be a podcast. It's going to save you money in the long run because you're going to be able to better identify certain anabolic steroids that are going to be able to boost your entire cycle and boost your free testosterone more than other anabolic steroids and get you better results on your cycle, save you money because you're not going to have to use a big dosage and all that other good stuff. So this is going to be a really important podcast to pay attention to. Let's first talk about understanding the role that sex hormone binding lobby and SHBG plays in the body. So, you know, the boring scientific stuff, look, we got to get in, we got to get into that. So you understand. So it is a, a glyo, a glycoprotein. It binds to androgens and estrogens in the body. All vertebrates have this except for birds. And from a chemistry standpoint, it's going to be mostly produced by the liver and released into the bloodstream. But it can also be produced in the brain and testes. So the specific type of SHBG produced in the testes is called androgen binding protein. And one of the things that, you know, that I've, you know, researched on this is that SHBG can fluctuate based on different things in the body. Insulin, which is a major problem in America. Uh, we have high insulin levels. Um, it's like a disease because we eat a big breakfast in the morning. We spike our insulin levels. They stay elevated throughout the day. We snack. We do all this. Look, when I grew up in the 80s, you know, you know, it was normal not to have a breakfast. You just, you just, you know, grew up. Your, your first meal of the day was lunch at school, and then you came home and you had a dinner. That's it. You had two meals. You didn't have a snack. Now you see people over the past you know, 15, 20 years, now people, they send their kids off to school. They, they force feed them a breakfast that the kids don't want, and then they pack snacks. Oh, we got to have a snack in between breakfast and lunch. We got to have a snack, big lunch. Then we got to have a snack in between lunch and dinner. Then we got to come home and have a big dinner, then have more snacks. So I watch TV. You know, that's that's the American lifestyle. So this is one of the reasons why we have these problems uh, when it comes to our testosterone levels as well is just the insulin issue. Growth hormones, another thing, and our growth hormone levels, because we're not getting enough sleep and we're stressed out too much, that's being affected. IGF-1, same thing. Prolactin, we have too much, uh, the electronics, the, uh, you know, the, 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 if you want to like play poker or, or play a slot machine, you can just go on your computer and push a button and play a casino game on your computer. These computer games that messes with your prolactin, that messes with neurotransmitters. All these things have different effects. Estrogen, thyro, thry, uh, thyroxine. So we have meta metabolic um, dysfunctions going on in our body. So all this has an effect on SHBG in the body and the inability to produce free testosterone, not just testosterone, but free testosterone. A lot of people out there, they're ignorant. They just focus on testosterone levels. Go back and listen to the prior episode, which, uh, which is episode 65, where we talk about this stuff. We talk about the differences between unbound and bound testosterone, between total and free testosterone. It's not about your total testosterone. It's about your free testosterone. So in an adult male mobster, overall, the normal SHB levels are should be between 20 to 60 nmol per liter, per liter. And those are the numbers. So 
what's happening if your SHBG is too high, you're obviously not going to be producing that ratio of free testosterone to total testosterone. So, you know, and we're going to get into different ratios later in the show as well. And we're going to kind of ping pong some of these ratios back and forth. Mobster, what are your thoughts so far? Yeah, I mean, look, Steve, the, 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 the kind of sort of takeaway I want some of our listeners to get just from this proportion, portion of the podcast so far is if you get this stuff right, you are not leaving, as we like to say, gains on the table. If you do the things that we talked about in show one with regards to lifestyle and diet and conditioning before you start a cycle, before you start to mess with testosterone, to improve your opportunities both for your naturally high levels or improving your levels from where they are to a higher level, and then do the things that we talk about in part two today, then you are going to get more from your cycle. Think of it as like a little takeaway secret. Imagine that you and your buddies are doing the same cycle you know, similar condition, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you do one or two things that we talk about today for the reasons that we're going to talk about today. Your gains will be better. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. It gets a little bit of chemistry, but it's not as complicated as you think. And we're going to explain the reasons for why. So make sure, like I said, you've got to listen to part one just to engage those fixes, just to make sure that you're doing everything right. Honestly, guys, there's a million shortcuts, and arguably PEDs are a kind of shortcut. But sometimes we talk about the sheer length of time you need to be in the gym. When we do people's logs, we talk about getting the basics right when it comes to food. I have seen people saying, oh, I can't do my steps today. It's raining. Put a coat on, motherfucker. Get out there with an umbrella and all these kind of things. And then there's an element of, in, in, in today's lifestyle, with the medications, with the stresses that Steve's talked about, for not doing certain things. Some of the things, even the metabolic stress and indicators of metabolic stress that Steve talks about come from the medications that people are already on, come from the elephants of the lifestyle. Steve, I don't have to commute to work anymore. Can you imagine being on an half nine, half eight, nine o'clock commute, the fucking stress standing up before you've even started the day and your boss gives you shit at work, you're worried about bills, blah, 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 right? Some of those things are easy fixes. Just go to work, go to work earlier. Don't go to work at the same fucking time. It's just little things. And then when you talk about the chemistry stuff, which we're getting to today, we know that a lot of PED users, and I'm going to include Steve, it's a bit Steve for me and myself, we end up as like sort of kind of pseudo slash amateur chemist in that we have a, a kind of sort of short range understanding. We don't understand chemistry full stop, Steve, but we have a kind of weirdly skewed understanding of some of the processes in our body. Now, as Steve and I do some of these shows, and hopefully our listeners as well, Steve, in order for us to know what we're talking about when we do these shows, we have to go away and do a little bit of research. Sometimes it's just refreshing our memory. We learn sometimes little things from these shows, which we immediately pass on to you as a sort of like us teaching you. But we're literally teaching ourselves at the same time. And sometimes it's just to remind ourselves of stuff that we've forgotten. And for, so, for example, there's nothing to stop me and Steve actually engaging one or two of these tricks today for our own benefits and to improve. Uh, uh, the gains that we get from a cycle. We might be doing a bunch of things already with regards to say, what we talked about in part one, but literally just today, Steve, I've never used, uh, and we're going to talk about these two specifically today, I've never used Mastodon and I've never used Proviron. Now, why the fuck not? Because literally what we've learned to put the show together for you guys is going to actually encourage me to have a look at those and maybe, maybe nothing stopping me using Proviron on any of my cycles, Steve. I train for strength. Why would I not want to get stronger? If being more muscular makes me stronger, why would I not do want? And so on. You know what I mean? It's just that kind of thinking. So hopefully yeah. you guys are so going to we, get the we, same We do have uh, <clears throat> one power lifter on the form. He's a big guy, mobster like you. But he yeah. actually says, yeah, I love pa mobster on. So he, th yeah, this see? is one of the reasons we do these podcasts. Sometimes yeah, yeah. I'm the general wisdom is, oh, you got to be lean to use master on. You know, well, you know, if that, you want but to that's for a different reason, exactly, Steve. Yeah. Sorry, to some interrupt people you. Are, are are going for the cosmetic look when everybody is, you know. So yeah, there, the, are the majority are the majority are. So if someone says, "If I take master on, I, I'm going to get leaner," you're going to no, 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 motherfucker, you're going to get harder. But as we just as Steve's talking about, and as I just said, literally using master on or provaron actually will improve the results. It will not necessarily get you ripped. 
if your diet's poor, if your lifestyle's poor, and if the person that's asking the question is 25% body fat, no, because part one, we talk about being lean, is actually going to benefit the results of your cycle. And that's going to increase your testosterone levels, all things considered and everything else being equal. But as a way of suppressing uh, the, uh, the SHBG, of allowing for more free testosterone to allow you to get a better results, absolutely it has a place. So like I said, if it's simply a case of you want to get lean and you want hard muscles, we don't know, no, no, motherfucker, you need to diet and do cardio and use Mastron. In fact, ideally, you'd have got kind of leaner before you started. But if you want to improve the results for your cycle, yes, Mastron has a place. So it's that slight confusion, Steve, and it applies to all of us. You know, it, not, me, me, nor you, nor anybody else claim to know every single thing about all these things all the time. But we are learning all the time. We're improving our knowledge base all the time and we're passing that knowledge on to you. On to the next section, Steve. Okay, so look, um, normal people, normal people, and you know, if you're just getting into using steroids, why do some people have high SHBG in the body? And people who have liver disease, uh, we see this with people who've abused alcohol over the years. This is another good reason why uh, those of you out there who like to argue with me over the years and say, oh, Steve, you know, it's okay if I have a couple beers, you know, it's not going to hurt me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually it is. It's going to, this is one of the reasons why, now you see why alcohol is absolutely horrible for muscle growth and strength. Because yes. liver disease, if you drink alcohol moderately, if you drink alcohol even a couple times a week, you're going to have liver disease because alcohol strains the liver. So that's going to affect your SHBG negatively. And that's one of the things. Being too underweight, uh, that comes with the territory. Um, if, yeah. you're not, if you're not getting enough nutrition in your diet, and this isn't something we see very much in America, but we might see it you know, in other countries. Um, if you've got poor testosterone and growth hormone levels, um, and again, in this example, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it, yes. that the, is it that the yes. low test and low growth hormone cause the SHBG high? Or is it the opposite? The high SHBG cause it. What came first? Really, in reality, um, it, it's a big, big, big macro look when it comes to this type of issue. It's It really goes hand in hand together. And, yeah, um, so, we go Steve, mm -hmm. so there are in, SHBG very high or SHBG very low as an indicator for multiple medical conditions. And that's why uh, chemists and specifically doctors would look at it as a, as a in part of your blood test. But equally, we're looking to manipulate it as, as we do when we train and we eat well and we use PEDs and get the, 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 the best results we can from using our knowledge in that particular way. But yeah, if you and I wasn't training, average Joe, like Steve said, and we went to the doctor and we got blood tests and we said we felt fatigued or whatever else, one of the indicators for potential medical conditions, and there's multiple, both in men and in women, would be either very high or very low, or certainly out of range, SHBG. Obviously, hopefully, we're reasonably healthy because we train. We're reasonably healthy because we have good nutrition. And then we're going to manipulate the variables. We're actually going to kind of arguably, Steve, use it <laughs> at, 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 at the, the levels, uh, but high or low. And we're going to manipulate it a little tiny bit. And we're going to, going to use it to our advantage to, again, gain more muscle, get stronger, get leaner, and so on. Yeah, and, and, and Mobster, once you get a little more into the next, uh, you know, paragraph, um, you know, next segment, talk about what happens when your SHBG is too high, your testosterone levels are low. Yeah, I mean, look, guys, this, this some of the testosterone levels kind of obvious insofar as that we all understand a, a, a Here's the thing, and we're actually going to give an example in a couple of minutes, Steve, as you can understand and, and, and know. We, we, we reference information and we work from not a script as such, but certainly guidelines that we have when we're doing these podcasts. Okay, so we're going to give you examples of someone with high testosterone, low SHBG, and vice versa. And we're going to say which of those two individuals got the best results. And we're going to use that as a sort of guideline to give you a vague indication, but it's in very, very simple terms, Steve. And if we, you and I have done multiple shows and everybody that trains and looks at PDs understands that for the most part, and again, this is with everything else optimal and being equal, high testosterone levels should mean better gains. 
bigger muscles, stronger muscles, better gains, leaner muscles, and all, all those things. We understand, and we did this in, in part one where we talked about what are normal levels for untrained individuals. We got a good idea with some of the clients that Steve, the cons consultations that Steve's done, with people coming in at high levels and still not making great gains and reasons why, and so on. But in very, very simple terms, high test, better. Low test, not so good. Now, that's an oversimplification because some people, and I can, I'm including myself here, may have moderate levels, but do very, very well. That might also be related to the simple fact that it's, I'm semi-retired, kind of stress-free for the most part. Uh, I'm out in the sunshine. I'm getting a fresh air, all the stuff that we talked about in past one. Now, so if why would we then want to have something that's taking any free testosterone that I might have and grabbing and using binding it to the SHBG way, way more than it needs to. I don't want high test levels and high levels of SHBG. I don't want my free testosterone, the stuff that's going to help me build muscle, being bound. I want it unbound. I want it free. I want it out of there floating around. The, the bound test essentially is, for argument's sake, and again, I'm oversimplifying when I say this, it's already stuck in the keyhole. It's already off doing something else. There are great reasons for your body to do that medical reasons, basic daily function. But we're not thinking like that, are we, Steve? We're bodybuilders, we're weightlifters. We want, right, okay, this is how much total testosterone I've got. What proportion is free? And free is available to help me build muscle. So it's no good me having a high testosterone level and too much free testosterone bound and becoming, un it's not going to become free, Steve. We want as much free test as possible. So, it's simple, it's going to prevent you from being able to build strength and muscle. By bringing down SHBG, you're able to break down barriers that are preventing you from achieving your fitness goals. Now, all of your listeners will have different reasons for hitting the gym. But ultimately, bringing it down, having uh, more free testosterone is going to mean that the stuff that you go to the gym for is, is made easier. Imagine this, Steve. It'd be like driving a car with your foot on the fucking brake all the time. Well, I can't, I, my car's supposed to be able to do 150, but with my foot on the brake, in the engine revving like a motherfucker, I'm only doing 130. Well, this is like a high ace, high ace APG is like having your foot on a brake, it's holding you back. So we want to free up or have as high of a level of free testosterone as possible. I'll read the next section here, Steve. When testosterone becomes real usable testosterone, it does not have the tendency to convert in estrogen because it's already converted into usable testosterone. Furthermore, having a low SHBG level will lower the conversion ratio with estrogen, with therefore minimum use of anti-estrogens are needed. Now, let me touch on this briefly, Stephen. We're going to try and include this in the show today. So one of our members on the forum, I won't name him, was trying to work out a way that if he could use what amounted to TRT levels of testosterone, could he then manipulate that as much as possible? Uh, again, just 300 milligrams a week, there or thereabouts, with Provaron, with Masteron. Could I free, get as more free testosterone if I did that with TRT levels and therefore have bodybuilder-like results? And the simple answer to that was no. You're not going to turn into Mr. Olympia, or as he, he wanted, Andrew Tate, an MMA ass-kicking millionaire, uh, using 300 milligrams a week. But the kind of theory sort of made sense. It just didn't make sense at 300 milligrams a week. So he said, and I think my response was thus, Steve. I said, if it was possible to do what you suggested with 300 milligrams a week, every motherfucker on the forums, every of our listeners now, and all the Mr. Olympians and athletes out there would be doing the same. They'd be using very, very small amounts of testosterone as a PED in addition to what they would naturally produce. Uh, and they would be out there winning the Olympic gold medals or winning the Mr. Olympia or adding 10 pounds of muscle. And in reality, they could not. But what we're talking about here is someone is both off cycle, increasing the natural testosterone, decreasing the amount of SHBG, freeing up more testosterone off cycle. And then when they go on cycle, allowing the testosterone that they're taking in the various forms, different anabolic steroids that we like to use and having them as also boost our free testosterone and getting the best possible fucking results. It won't happen, as I pointed out to that particular individual, on a low amount of testosterone. And of course, he's young enough that he'd be suppressing his natural test uh, and he would only be replacing what he already had with something else that's about the same. And therefore, even 
a little bit of an increase didn't make sense to me, especially as, of course, he wanted to look like a bodybuilder. In reality, he would just be a healthy young man that he was already, but he'd be using testosterone. And even with more free testosterone, he still only to look the same as he already did. That didn't make any sense. The listeners of this show, typically people that train, good, sensible nutrition, they could always be better, they could drink less alcohol, they could have less parties, they could smoke less, they could be less stressed. So you address all those things, and then you listen to this show because you like to listen to us talking about anabolics. So therefore, anything that we can tell you, as per this show, that benefits your anabolic use and enhances the results you get with sensible cycles has got to be a plus, Steve. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we're we're all about, you know, getting – we want to we wanna use less and get more results. You know, and that's that's the little secret here. And the nice yeah. thing about your pharmacies, your pharmacies, they want you to be successful. They don't want, yes. you know, we're not doing these podcasts to sell you a bunch of gear until you go buy five grams of gear and run that a week. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. long term, you know, you're going to you're going to probably kill yourself. So you're not going to be able to come back and buy more steroids anyway. Right. So, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we want we want you to, to get the most out of your cycle and take advantage of your cycle. And that's, yes. that's, that's part of the thing. So, you know, look, I'll give you an example of a real world scenario. Mobster, yeah. you want to talk about the real world scenario? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll kind I'll of read, give my version. examples yeah. there. And we'll, me and you have a back and forth, right? So we're going to have two examples of two individuals and we're going to assume that they're training. But before, the before that, let's talk about a little bit about estrogen. Um, yes. And, and let me just explain this really quick. Just, Let's get this, the boring science stuff out of the way, but we got to really talk about this. So when testosterone becomes real usable testosterone, it does not it does not have the tendency to convert into estrogen because they're already converted into usable testosterone. So having a lower SHBG level not only does what we talked about on the last podcast and we're going to talk about on this podcast, which is benefit your cycle entirely, boost your free testosterone. It also will lower the conversion ratio with estrogen. So you're gonna have let you're you're gonna be able to use less. This is why guys, you ever notice monster guys on the forum? They'll come on the forum and they'll be like, I'm running 250 milligrams of testosterone, and I'm running Primo, and I'm running Proviron, or I'm running Masteron and, and Anavar, whatever, or just running Masteron. And they're they come on the forum, they're like, Look, I got blood work done, my estrogen levels are in line. Do I still need an AI? And then someone will come in and say, Yeah, you probably should run an AI, and then someone else. You know, need so yeah. So as Mobster said earlier, I just wanted to clarify that. That's why you see that on the forum. I know Mobster already explained that, but Mobster, yeah. why don't you get into the, um, the yeah the examples? Yeah, right. with the examples. So so this is the sort of thing where, and again, it's that it's clear, clarifying the misunderstandings and giving you examples, and you say to yourself, which of the following two individuals are probably going to get the best result, right? So example number one, you're using 500 milligrams of test cypionate per week. And they might have up to 3,000 nanograms a deciliter with total uh, in, with totals and 600 nanograms a deciliter with free testosterone, right? But high SHBG, uh, 50-ish, it says here, with high estrogen. And then compare this against someone else. Less tests, 250 to 300 milligrams of test cypionate with totals measured in the bloods of 2,000 to 2,500, 2,500 nanograms of deciliter. And listen to the following number carefully. 900 to 1,300 uh, of free tests, which is obviously more actual usable test, and low SHBG, 16 instead of 50, and low estrogen. Now, of, I, I look at these two things, Stephen. Of course, we're doing this podcast. Instantly, you're going to go, right, it's got to be number two. Absolutely number two. Why? Why, why is number two? They're using less testosterone. Their numbers, 2,000 to 2,500, is more than enough to encourage anabolic responses in the body, stronger, muscular, leaner. The, but look at that free testosterone number. Now, there might be a bunch of issues here. We've touched this on other shows. And even in part one, we said, listen, which of those individuals has got the high level of body fat? Which of those individuals has got a poor diet? Which of those individuals is not cleaning in the gym? Which of those individuals is not doing the cardio? I'm going to guess, Steve, specifically with the SHBG at 50 and high estrogen, it's number one. He's not doing the things he should be doing to get into better shape before the cycle, 
He's not doing enough cardio to maintain a decent level of health, keeping him physically active. Perhaps he takes too long in the gym, in between sets and so on and so forth. He's not elevating his heart rate. He's eating shit. Mentioned Steve had mentioned at the beginning snacks and so on and so forth. And yet he's on more testosterone. He's on 500 milligrams versus example two, the 250 to 300. He's actually got more testosterone in his body, 3,500, sorry, 3,000 nanograms a deciliter. But he's only got 600 nanograms a deciliter of free test. But he's got that high estrogen and so on. So you go instantly, you can see where the mistakes are being made. You can see that he should be doing certain things that he's not doing. And you compare him against the second one. And the, 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 the takeaway, there's two takeaway numbers here, the nine, 900 to 1,300 nanograms a deciliter of free test and specifically that low SHBG number of 16 compared to 50, and low estrogen. I mean, honestly, Steve, this person's absolutely fucking lutely going to have better results. I'd actually argue, Steve, it's, 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 you could change the example. You could have him take in 500 milligrams of test CPNA, exactly the same example one. You could see that his uh, nanograms of deciliter were the same, but because he's got low estrogen, because he's got low SHBG, I would suspect he would have even more free testosterone. So he's just going to do as well, if not better, certainly better, arguably better, than pretty much anybody else doing exactly the same thing, but with the other measures and the other numbers off. And it's kind of obvious. You, you Listen, those of us that have been doing this for a long time, I've stood at many a gym counter back in the day, Steve, and obviously via the post, et cetera, on the forum, and you just absolutely know if someone comes onto the forum, and as I said earlier on, they've got 25%, 30% body fat, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and they're doing the other. They could be using two times the most testosterone I've ever used in my life, and they will not get the results that they want to get. It's, it's, it's like someone when it says they want to take a supplement or use a steroid, uh, and I'm 300 pounds, and I want to get down to 200 pounds, I'm massively over, I'm massively fat. You go, okay, please let us know that you're doing a diet. Please let us know that you're doing cardio. Please let us know that you're literally eating less and being more active than you're used to. It's that kind, it's that kind of obvious. But sometimes when you are training hard in the gym, you like to think that your, your practices and the things that you're doing, and I don't want to sound too preachy, Steve, are on point. We all like to think we're working hard. We all like to think that our diet's good. But then you'll get, as Steve said earlier on in the show, someone that only has a few beers at the weekend. A few beers is never serious. It's you know it is one o'clock in the fucking morning by the pool at your mate's house, and it, a few beers isn't three beers, it's six or seven beers. And you know, you know that drinking less beer or no beer would be better for you. Beer just without the empty calories, Steve, is a fucker for estrogen. It really is. And a few beers would almost be okay, but five, six, seven beers is not, and so on. So it's just correcting these little things giving yourself every opportunity to make the absolute best gains you possibly can. Do you want to cover a bit of that, Steve, before we yeah. move on to supplements? Yeah, and just really quick, it's like I said in this last segment, about being optimal. Um, what yes, separates absolutely. those two examples that Mobster said? You got a person doing need to do to take more advantage of their cycle, and you got another person that's wasting their stack, having to run more gear to get the same results. And here's yes. the thing. Unfortunately, in bodybuilding, it's not black and white because – you know, genetics are a factor. I remember mm. when I was a weightlifter, um, you know, when I first started weightlifting in high school, I busted my ass the entire summer between my junior and senior year. I never saw – there was this kid. He never showed up. He was a, a running back on the football team. He was a star athlete, whatever. He never fucking showed up. I didn't see him the entire summer showing up, but I'm in there like almost every day in the heat. There wasn't any air conditioner in our gym. It's like 95 degrees, right? Fucking hot as shit. I'm sweating, but I'm in there just busting my ass to the point I'm going to throw up that entire summer just to qualify for state weightlifting, in which I did, you know, and that's great. But I did it because of my hard work. My genetics were not as good as the other kid. The other kid, I saw maybe three times the entire year show up. Yet he qualified for state and went to state and got like top three in his in his weight class. I got number eight in my weight class. What's the difference? The difference is he had superior genetics. This guy went on to play in the NFL to get drafted like in the third round in the NFL. That's how genetically gifted it is. So when it comes to this stuff, unfortunately, it's not black and white. We can only control what we can control. 
So you've got to control everything that you can hum hum humanly possibly yes. control to get the most out of your stack. So let's get into yes. supplements, Mobster, that will boost free testosterone. So in part one, you can go back and listen to it. We explain the difference between total and free testosterone. And yeah. look, I'm going to summarize it. We're not going to go over everything over again. If you want to listen to the full discussion, go back and listen to that episode, which is, of course, episode 65. But look, bottom line is, as I said earlier in the podcast, you've got free versus uh, wow. uh, uh, total testosterone. you got bound versus unbound. What counts is the free testosterone. So um, a, a lot of times people can get away with using less testosterone, less hormones on the cycle if they're just able to tap into that free testosterone. So getting your SHB levels low, you'll have a greater conversion ratio from the bound total serum testosterone that gets converted into free usable testosterone. So we're going to get into some supplements here. The first supplement, really the number one supplement in my mind is going to be three, four Devonol. And this is an active compound of stinging nettle root. And, and look, the bottom line is with this supplement, the best testosterone boosters that you see out there, they better have yeah. this ingredient in it. If they don't, then it's garbage. So this supplement is the number one supplement that I know of, and, and it's considered something that really works well. So this is a great thing to use in PCT between cycles, especially because it helps bind to the SHB. So it keeps your free testosterone stronger when you need it the most in PCT, when your testosterone levels are crashing between cycles, when your testosterone levels are trying to recover. So even if you use anabolic steroids, you're like, shit, why do I need a supplement? Well, this is a good useful supplement in between cycles, or if you're on TRT even, it's a good natural way to get some SHBG binding. So we've seen people on this supplement that has showed that their total testosterone levels, this has been like later in PCT when their body's still in the recovery mode, barely above water. Maybe their test total testosterone levels may be like 250 or 300 but their free testosterone levels were within range, well within range, thanks to using stingle, uh, stinging nettle root 3,4 Devonol. So this is a great supplement, Mobster. And if you come on the forum, we can um, help you find a supplement from one of our uh, approved sources that does yeah. contain not just 3,4 Devonol, but other ingredients like Fidosia, Tribulus. We had discussed these on, on the last episode as well. Mom, sorry, you want to talk, touch on these sub Yeah, I, 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 I was actually kind of against this a couple of years ago, Stephen. I said I couldn't understand the point of using the testosterone booster containing these multiple ingredients, including the stinging little root. I was like, okay, explain this to me. But we've done a couple of shows on it, and it starts to make sense to me. So you will not boost your body's ability to produce testosterone. It's suppressed. It's recovering. That's the reason why we talk about PCTs. That's the reason why we say try to have as much time off in between cycles to get back to your normal levels. Anabolic steroids will suppress your ability to produce it. But even with the anabolic steroids, you're still looking at free and total testosterone. You're still looking at bound and unbound. So as you do recover in a PCT, as you do recover with the time off, your body starts to produce more. That's the idea. That's the reason why we do these things. Assuming you haven't fucked up guys and stayed on steroids for years, et cetera, et cetera. Given time, and if you haven't been done absolutely crazy, fucked up shit, or you've got any medical issues, you should see something like a recovery close to or hopefully as good as before, back to normal, right? So I was like, okay, so why do we need to do this? Well, let's imagine you are producing some testosterone. Your body's slowly starting to produce what it is. There's still going to be some esters of the testosterone. It's in your system. So some this is another reason for having as much time off as possible. But the half-lives and the whole... As Steve says, the calculation of how long it takes to completely clear your system and so on and so forth. But why the fuck should we not want to start the recovery? Why shouldn't we want to free up as much testosterone as possible, including during a PCT, including during a recovery process? So then I goes, okay. And then we started to discuss the ingredients. Then we started to look at what might help. And then we start to realize, hey, so even if my testosterone is suppressed and it's just starting to recover, and it's only at this level compared to where it was when I was on cycle. I'm still going to keep my gains and recover quicker and free up more testosterone to 
help maintain the muscle that I built on cycle, maybe even get another gain or two post cycle, you know, see when people start to eat a little bit more, for example, if after a competition or a modeling, modeling gig, then you start to see, and I talk about this quite often on the forum, Steve, keeping your gains, having better recovery, having feeling better in your PCT, feeling better post cycle. So many people struggle with the thing. Sometimes I feel an absolutely godlike for a few individuals on cycle and then coming off cycle and either make a meal of the PCT or even if they do a perfect PCT, Steve, just not feeling absolutely crazy like they did just a few weeks ago in the middle of that cycle. So anything that's going to help you in that particular way starts to make sense. And I'm going, okay, Steve, I'm looking at these ingredients. I'm seeing what we're talking about here. As I said earlier, I'm learning as well, even as we do these shows, and I start to get it. It starts to make sense to me. And so, for example, Steve, I use a product. It's very, very similar to what you've just discussed. In fact, it's from the same company that does exactly the same thing, and that goes right in the day one of the PCT. It's right there. It's helping me. It's not going to make my body recover per se. That's going to happen slowly. And naturally, Steve calls a PCT quite often a soft landing. That's still the case. But what we are looking at here is we're keeping gains, keeping that muscle and freeing up so that we got more free testosterone, which is exactly what we had when we was on cycle. It's the reason why we're talking about the next cut port portion of this podcast, doing things on cycle to make more free testosterone, to give us an ability to, in during cycle, build muscle, create new muscle, get stronger, be stronger than I was before, and post-cycle to keep that muscle, to try and stay as close as I can to that stuff. Let's talk about the Masteron and Proviron now, Steve, and, and how they can work on the cycle. Yeah, so, you know, look, we've taught, we've touched on supplements that bind to SHBG. Now let's get into the, the fun stuff, the anabolic steroids that do the best at binding to SHBG. So there's two that stay now. Mobster is going to get into specifically Masteron. I'll talk about Proviron myself. So, look, at the end of the day, if you want to fight a house fire, you, you'll need more than a hose, all right? And at the end of the day, supplements are nice. You know, Mobster and I, we're all for supplements, natural herbals. I'm a big believer in them. Um, they, they're naturally, they come from nature. I'm a big believer. They have their benefits. We've been using these herbals for hundreds and thousands of years. But look, there's more effective ways to boost free testosterone by binding to SHB in the body, especially on cycle. And the, the number one and number two anabolic steroids for this purpose are Masteron by your pharmacies and Proviron by your pharmacy. So um, both of them do an exceptional job of binding to SHBG. In fact, when you go on these anabolic steroids and you get blood work done, you get before and during blood work done on, on and off of these steroids, you'll notice your SHBG levels absolutely get crushed, which is a good thing because that means the other steroids in your stack are going to be more effective. That means that your free testosterone ratio will rise and your free testosterone will rise. So you're going to have more of that free testosterone that we're looking for here. Um, and at the, at, 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 at the end of the day, um, you know, uh, your pharmacies, they've got you covered. They've got, it's called, they call it the Provixin 25, which is 25 milligrams per pill of the Proviron. And that, if you, if you like taking something that's an oral form, that's going to be something for you right there. They have a master on Enantate, 150 milligrams a milliliter. If you want to go with the injectable, a long ester injectable, something you only have to inject once or twice a week. They have a master on propanate, 75 milligrams a milliliter. If you want something that you'll have to inject, and, you know, some people like to inject it every day, every other day, every three days would be okay uh, with the, with the propanate. So that would be an option for you. If you want it to be in your system quicker, you can go ahead and inject the propanate every day or every other day. It'll be in your system within a week and a half you'll have that binding to SHBG. So these are the two best. And this is why you see so many professionals, you see their, their cycles. And we're going to talk about, um, in the next couple episodes, we're going to talk about a bodybuilder who had passed away. And you'll notice that he's running both Proviron and Masteron in the cycle and other DHTs as well. And there's a reason for that because it's actually making his other steroids work even better and better and better. So Mobster, get into... What you saw about Masteron, how effective specifically Masteron is when it comes for binding to SHBG? Yeah, arguably, actually, Stephen, it's my, my fault when we did the pre-show 
Provaren is el numero uno. It really is. So one of the things that I did is I went away and did a little bit of studying on SHBG pre-show, as we do always. We always refresh our memories and we do a little bit of research. And uh, ironically, this is actually from Wikipedia, and I'm going to, it's a sex hormone binding globulin, and that was a specific reference. And then they've got a bunch of uh, things that are drop-down panels that you can look at. For example, 70 medications for SHBG and CBG. Uh, affinities of 21 progestins for SHBG and CBG and so on. But the one that grabbed my my eye, and I talked to Steve about this in the pre-show, was affinities of 14 anabolic steroids for SHBG. I'm going to read out some very, very common ones, and then, then you're going to see that how, pro, ironically, it doesn't list all the steroids, and annoyingly, Steve, it doesn't list Masteron, which is a bit of a piss. So, but there you go. This is 14 anabolic steroids, but it does include one of the medical names for Provarum. I'll read you out some stuff that people would be the reference that they gave, which was the reference ligand 100% for SHBG with dihydrotestosterone. Okay, so that's the marker. Think of that as the, the listeners as the marker by which anything else can be compared. Then you've got, and this is an example, Steve, and I'm going to use, I'll, I'll get to the goodie in a minute, all right? Dianabol compared to DHT was two. Don't forget, dihydrotestosterone, 100. Dianabol, in terms of its ability to bind, give free testosterone and, su and suppress H SHBG, was two. Anadrol was slightly more than one. The indicator in front of it just suggests greater than one, but that's it. Stanozole, one. Testosterone, just straight testosterone, Steve, 19. Fluoroxymesterone, slightly more than one. And then there's a bunch of others which are essentially pro-hormones or pseudo-steroids, et cetera, et cetera. Mestalone, or mestorolone, as I say it properly, guys, which is Proviron, 440, Steve. So don't forget, dihydrotestosterone was the baseline indicator at 100. It is 4.4 times better at freeing up testosterone. It is... I'm trying to do a rough number. I think it's like 80 times better than straight testosterone. So just, just use that as a sort of vague indicator in your mind, just how fucking goddamn effective Provarin. Now, as I said, annoyingly, it only lists 14 anabolic steroids. If there was a longer list of steroids, Steve, I'm sure Masteron would have been on there. But we know that Masteron is effective. I'm going to say, I think, and this is just guessing me as we do this show when I talk about this stuff, I'm more than happy to be proved wrong. I believe it's somewhere between two and 300 against the Proviron at 440 and certainly, again, against the marker of dihydrotestosterone at 100. So it's almost as effective. So you can pick from what you want. And, of course, don't forget, when you're putting cycles together, you might have specific aims for your cycle versus me versus Steve and so on and so forth. So, for example, we know that Masteron is a hardener and you can include it in your cycle for that. But look what Steve said just now, okay? We're going to do a whole show on that particular athlete that we can talk about. And it, we have to, because it's super important, talk about the sheer amount of steroids that he was using. And sometimes... You look at certain, and he's not the only athlete like this, of course, and he's a great guy, unfortunately passed away. We look at certain cycles, and the thing that catches our eyes more than anything else, Steve, when we look at those cycles, is sometimes just a sheer volume, the sheer, the crazy number, the 5,000 milligrams a week. That's what grabs Roy. But in reality, he was a championship bodybuilder. Be, from an amateur to a pro, he was winning the class. He was out there. He was working his ass off. And we're going to cover this in the, in the show where we do about him and talk about some of those things. But he was on a lot of gear. So the number grabs your eyes. The sheer amount of insulin, the sheer amount of growth hormone grabs your eyes. But what you should also be looking at in this example, and as Steve just pointed out, why was he using Proviron? Why was he using Masteron? Now, he had a very vascular, hard-looking physique, Steve, so I can see that there's two reasons. And the, the, certainly when it comes to the master on as a hardener, but he's also going to make the, as we like to put it crudely, the gear that he was using and the volume of gear that he was using more effective. In other words, if he was a lazy motherfucker that didn't train hard in the gym, didn't diet properly, et cetera, et cetera, and still use a shitload of gear, he'd have some muscle, but he wouldn't be a world-class bodybuilder. He would not be a champion body, and he probably almost certainly would never made it to a pro. So what he's sensibly done, arguably with regards to the amounts that he was taking, maybe less sensible, but sensibly that in his cycle is he's using Masteron and Proviron, both at the same time, 
certainly in points of the cycle, certainly in points of the competition cycle, to get the best results from that cycle. And of course, it will change as he approaches a competition or an event that he wants to get into shape for. So there's there's definitely elements in there. But again, like Steve said, I'd be very surprised if there's a single top competitive bodybuilder. We talk about this all the time, Steve, who's not using trend. And certainly either Provarad or Master. And I'm, I'm going to say Master probably very highly, Steve, just for let it get to, to, for, uh, in terms of getting harder muscular. Talk about dosing there, Steve. Let us know the kind of numbers that we're looking at here. So with Proviron, look, I've always got good results between 25 and 50 milligrams a day. Now, if you're a professional, obviously you want to, you're going to hike that up to 75, 100 or more. I've seen guys go 125, 150. But if you're just running a normal steroid cycle, 25 to 50 gets the job done, even just 25 milligrams. Now, the good thing about Proviron is it's not 17 alpha alkylated. So it's not going to be as liver toxic as some of these other oral steroids. So that's good. That means that you can run it your entire 10 or 12 weeks of your cycle. You don't have to worry about the liver toxicity like you would other oral anabolic steroids. When it comes to Masteron, I run Masteron 500 milligrams a week. I got crazy good hardening effects, crazy good hardening effects. It did a great job of buying the SHBG just like Proviron will. And, and you know, that's basically, I think anywhere from 300 the 500 milligrams is really all you need if you're if you're a normal Joe who just likes to use steroids. You're a normal gym rat. Obviously, professional bodybuilders they'll jack the dose up 750, 1000, 1250, 1500, on and on and on. You know they're gonna want to get the most out of the master on. So really, you're covered. So if you wanted to do 300 milligrams, you you do the Euro Pharmacies Mass E. You would just do two CCs a week, and boom, you're done. You know that's all you need. Um, so if you want to go the injector route, that's what you would want to, uh, that's where you, what you would do. And then, um, it, you know, on the propanate, you could do every other day, one CC every other day. And that would give you uh, a solid amount. I think like around what, 400 mobster a week. It'd give you, let me do the math on that. Um, so you take, basically, this is what you would do. If you're calculating every other day and that's 75 milligrams a milliliter, you take the 75, and you multiply by 3.5 because that's half as many days as in a week. And boom, you get 262. So it's a little short of 300 milligrams. Yeah, so yeah. with the Masteron, you might want to go with um, you know a little higher if you wanted to get closer to 300 milligrams in your injecting. So let's say you did two cc's every other day. That'd be 150 times uh, 3.5. And doing the calculator here to get you up to 525. So anywhere between one to two cc's every other day would get you in this sweet spot or, or where you should be when it comes to the master. Room. It's it's really that simple. Monster, your thoughts on the uh, uh, dosing? I mean, look, at the end of the day, you remember you're stacking it. So the, the way I rec the, the thing I recommend is, as I said earlier, if you're using the master on NNT, you definitely want to get it going. Even if you're like, well, I just want to run it toward the end of my cycle. You still want to get it going earlier because you're going to remember the NFA test. Yeah. It's yeah. going to take three, four, maybe five weeks to start peaking in your system. So you want to get it in your system early um, so that it's going. Another cool thing about Proviron too, uh, and then I'll let you take over, Mobster. But another thing, cool thing about Proviron is I've seen the blood work. And Proviron is one of those weird anabolic steroids that yeah. really you can categorize not just as an anabolic steroid but as a drug yes. and the reason i say that is because i've seen people use proviron in pct and it has not interfered with their pituitary with their recovery during pct mm -hmm. so that is really good so if you're in a situation where I've seen probably 60, 70% of the people who run blood work with Proviron not get suppressed on Proviron. So you could use it in PCT or even early on during your bridge to kind of get you through and help get that free testosterone up and get that free testosterone ratio up. And a lot of people will do that in PCT and it will work for them and it won't interfere with their recovery. It's really a fascinating um, steroid. It's, it's really... Uh, and it's not liver toxic, as I said. So, I mean, the benefits are endless when it comes to Proviron, Mobster. I mean, based on what yeah. you said with the study that you that you read. Yeah, 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 yeah. And everything. It's one of the best 
One of, really Absolutely. one of the best things. They didn't give the full list there, Steve, but 4.4 4 times as best as, a, as, they, as the baseline measure for anything. That's fantastic. Let me read this line out to you, listeners. Provarin does not elevate total testosterone. I would less arguable, but whatever. But Provarin raises free testosterone by reducing SHBG. So it's, it, it, it's, it, it's almost, I, I, I hesitate to use this turn of phrase, Steve, it's almost a wonder drug. In, in terms of what it's doing, in terms of suppression, in terms of what Steve said with people that are doing PCT and they've used Provarin and so on and so forth, in terms of not suppressing certain measures that you would think would normally be suppressed, and yet at the same time, freeing up more testosterone to allow you to build muscle on cycle and retain muscle off cycle. That, that, that to me, honestly, Steve, I should have paid more attention in class, as they say, in terms of the responses uh, that things that could benefit me why, even if I do the same goddamn motherfucking cycle that I did last time and the cycle before and the cycle before, but I now add Proviron, I should get better results. How cool is that, listeners? Come on. Absolutely. Listen, right? I mean, this is a super important thing in, in terms of, and I don't want to bang this drum too hard, Steve, okay? But it really, really, really comes down to the kind of things that you can do before you start training, well, sorry, not when, before you start using PEDs and certainly before you do your next cycle. And in terms of, again, it's like having, imagine, let me give you an example. You have a bet with your buddy, $50, a steak dinner. And a, and a winner gets a steak dinner from the other person. And you're, you're twins, you're not even buddies, you're twins. You both weigh 200 pounds. You're both five foot nine inches tall. Which of you is going to get the best results? The one with the more free testosterone, the one that's looking at Bravarin using it, one that's looking at Mastron and using it to enhance the results. This is simple as that. It really, really is. I mean, this is the reason why it was Europharma's idea that we discussed this and absolutely said, listen, right? okay, what, what, why, why, why do we need to discuss? Well, motherfucker, go and do your research. Look at what the, look at what happens. Oh, now this starts to make sense. Now I understand why professional bodybuilders are doing it. Honestly, I swear to God, and I said this earlier on in the show, it's like learning something new, Steve. A little twist, a little trick that's actually going to enhance maybe the next time I do a cycle. Provarin's not even that expensive. Neither of them are that expensive. And again, look, this is another example, right? Uh, and this is just for the monetary minded, the one of you with more fiscal and financial thinking. You're going to get more value for your bucks. If you spend a typical cycle somewhere between $500 and $1,000, it's going to be closer to $1,000 with your ancillaries over, let's say, 12 weeks, and you spend another couple of hundred bucks, but your muscle added, let's say it was eight pounds, but now it's going to be 10 pounds. It's going to be 10 pounds of muscle. You start to look at post-cycle, keeping eight pounds of muscle from your 10 pounds instead of eight pounds and going down to six pounds. Doesn't that make sense to you? Doesn't it mean that you're benefiting from this information? Absolutely, Steve. Have we got time? I think yeah, I want to touch on this, uh, listeners, because it's super, super important to talk about Europharma, right? Now, Steve knows, and I'll do the majority of yeah. like, let's Yeah, let me start off um, yeah, really yeah, quick. Yeah. So Europharmacies, look, they're, I know Mobster has used them way more than I have, but I've used them plenty in the past three, four years, by the way. And I really like their injectables and their orals. The bottom line is, I talked about earlier, Proviron, using it in PCT for some of you, using it in bridging, using it toward the end of cycles. Look, here's the problem. If you use a fake Proviron, that's really something else, it will have devastating effects. It will completely ruin your PCT, completely ruin your recovery. So you have to know what you're using. If you're going to use these, these compounds, you have to know what you're using. I've seen in the past too with Masteron, DECA, be used in place of Masteron. I've seen Winstrol be used in place of Masteron by sources because the sources are lazy. They don't care about their customers. They don't get their they don't get their stuff tested. They produce it. They don't test it. They just send it out. And they are more worried about profits than they are making sure they get good because they're fly by night. They're only going to be around a while. Your pharmacies have been around a long time, officer. What, 15 years or longer they've been around? So they I mean, 20, 20 years, Steve? 20, 20 years. years. And look, they have a strong customer base that keeps coming back for a reason. That's where they make their living from customers coming back. So of course they want you to come back. Of course they want to produce products, which are what they claim. If they put 
something as Proviron on that label, it's going to be Proviron. If they put something as Masteron on that label, it's going to be Masteron. And that's the number one most important thing, especially someone like me, who when I first got into anabolic steroids, I would basically end up getting fake gear because back in those days, it wasn't that easy to get gear as it is today. So today you have companies like Real Pharmacies producing great products. They're being independently tested anonymously. And we know that when you buy Proviron and you're using 50 milligrams a day of Proviron, 99% of that Proviron and 99% of that Masteron that you're using is that product. That's how it should be. So Mobster, yeah, talk about your pharmacies and finish it out the podcast. Yeah, Steve knows I'm a huge fan of uh, Europharmacies, and they're my go-to, Steve. That's how I call them. There's a bunch of companies I've used. There's a bunch of products from different companies that I've used. And if I've used it and it works, I recommend it to listeners. The shows that we've done where we talked about products, I said, I haven't used that one yet, Steve, but you have, or I have, but I have used that company and sold. Europharmacy is my daily go-to. 90% of my cycles, not all of them, but 90% of my cycles over the last five, six, seven years have been Europharmacy cycles. Now, there are others, but they're the, they're the number one, right? So what are you looking at? The, this stuff, just as a customer, Steve, one of the best reps in the business. We're going to be doing an interview with him soon in a, in a podcast. This guy is amazing. Customer service online, fantastic. They, 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 they even treat their workers well, Steve. I said about one of the few companies that had closed his shop to send her, just to make sure their workers who Working fucking hard, Steve. Have a little bit of time off. Some of the other companies are desperate for a buck and they're open 24-7. Your pharmacy is actually you know, rewards the people that work for them. What else? I mean, look, Steve, they're completely open and honest when it comes to certificates of analysis. There is a, there's, even in pharmaceutical products produced by big pharma type companies, there is an allowable deviation. If you say a product that says 100 milligrams, it can have plus or minus five milligrams. There's an allowable percentage. Typically, the closer the company is to the 100%, the better. Okay? So you'll get certificates of analysis. I've seen this from a couple of companies, Steve. Not an approved source, it has to be said. Where the fucking thing every single time was dead up. If it's impossible for pharmaceutical giants to do it, how is it possible for you to do it? So I actually prefer certificates of analysis to be completely honest. If a product's taken from a sample line, sent off to an independent lab, boom, and it comes back at 98.4% or something like that. That, to me, that's honest. That's telling you, listen, we're trying to goddamn best stuff like that, it's legitimate, because they can go away and get another product tested. They'll find the one that gives us 100%, and that's the one that we've published. No, this is the one that we took. This is the batch number it came from. This is the date it was produced. We sent it off to Independent Lab. This is what come back. They, they had an issue with a company that was producing product for them recently, and it was so fucking far off. Within three days of having a, this product tested, they contacted every single customer that had bought that product recently from that batch and either offered to replace it or gave them credit against their next order. Within three days, 72 hours sleep. They weren't fucking around, right? So that's another one. They were doing stuff recently, and I've discussed this on another show. They said, we want to improve the service that we give to customers. What information are we not including on our website on the reseller's website, for example, that uh, you want to see. What products do you want to see? Are we producing a great range of products already? Is there something you'd like to see? Is there, for example, differences in the milligrams per mil that you'd like to have? They literally asked customers what information, how to improve the service that they were already doing. Could you get, could, do we need to give you a better explanation for how this is produced? They've switched, for example, and I believe they're probably the number one at this at the minute, Steve, from 10 mil vials, which is the industry standard and has been for a fucking ridiculously long time, 20, 30 years, absolutely, probably longer, probably since we ever started having vials over opioids, and started producing 15 mil products. Pretty much everything they're doing is switching over from 10 mil to 15 mil. They're probably the leader, El Numero Uno, in that. If there are other companies out there doing it, I'm not aware of it. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, just means I'm not aware of it. But certainly amongst the sources that you and I are familiar with, Steve, I don't think anybody else is doing that. So it's they, they, they are they are constantly trying to improve their products. And the other thing, and I'll touch on this, it's kind of obvious, like Steve said, with regards to the 20, something around 20 years that they've been around. Right? What does that say to you? Companies that produce nice products to begin with 
then the kind of service starts to fall off, the quality starts to fall off, the milligrams per mil starts to fall off, products are swatched in and out from one ingredient to another ingredient, are 10 a penny. We've seen them. We've used them. I've had fake products like Steve said. Ultimately, they got 30 bucks off of me or 50 bucks off of me for a vial, bottle of pills, whatever. But that's all they get. They won't get that money again. So what do you do? You produce solid products on a daily basis, and you don't just do that for a year or two years like some fly-by-nights, nine months, I can think of one example, Steve. You get the people to come back by consistently being on point, by consistently trying to improve, by adding to the product line, by producing blends that people are actually using, by combining products that people are going to combine already to save them having to do that. And then you do deals, then you do sales, then you get yourself out there in the marketplace and you build up a great reputation for that. Doesn't have to be fancy. I believe one of their products is, is a an example, Steve. They changed the labeling four years ago, five years ago, from single layer labeling to triple layer labeling. I've never done it, Steve, but you can peel off the label of one of their products and it will have another label underneath and then the reverse of that label. So they're giving you all the information you want on the product there. You can go online and check them for, against product numbers and batches and all this kind of stuff. So you start to do that. You understand, this is a, here's the final one. I talked about the difference between in-house testing, even using an independent lab, which is literally, I produce a steroid, I go to the batch of steroids I've just produced, and I take a bowl, a vial from that line. I stick it in a bag, stick it in a fucking phone box, whatever, and I send this off to an outside lab. Now, I can test it in-house, but I'm biased person who's doing the testing for me i don't want the boss to fuck up blah 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 no send it off to an independent lab which is named on a certificate of analysis have that product tested so what happened recently is even better we've talked about this on previous recent shows this was a bunch of approved sources including neuropharmacies where a single member of the forum has happened more than once but this particular person let's call them joe joe took 10 different products had them all tested and including Europharmacies, everything was within 96 or 97% of where it needed to be. Not one product failed. And that included Europharmacies. We love that kind of stuff, Steve. So, again, guys, we've given you some tricks and some techniques, specifically encouraging the use of Masteron and uh, Provira and the ability to produce more free testosterone, which means you're going to have more muscle, more strength, more gains. Let us know if we've missed anything in this show. Come onto the forums and check us out. Ask for better explanations if you think you need one. Certainly the understanding between free and bound, total testosterone, and the ability for Masteron and Provirum from Europharmacies to aid and boost more free testosterone for better results on your cycle. Please note, we are not doctors and the opinions are ours. It is our view and based on our experience and views on the topic. Our podcasts are for informational purposes and entertainment only. The freedom of speech and the First Amendment apply.